Welcome to the bonus episode of the Process Automation Podcast from ABB. I'm Fran Scott, maker, pyrotechnician, and engineering expert. And today, we're going to be hearing from Dave Allen, who we last met in our episode where we deep dived into the invisible threat of methane. And it was a fascinating. There was so much I didn't know that I didn't know about methane. And so that's why we are going to look into that subject further. So let's go. So Dave, uh, in one sentence, can you tell us who you are and your job title, please? My name is Dave Allen. I'm a professor at the University of Texas, where I do work on energy and the environment. Okay. And using three sentences, can you tell us what that means in, in terms of the bigger picture stuff? So I focus on greenhouse gases, in particular greenhouse gases from the energy sector. My main focus has been the oil and gas sector and the emissions of greenhouse gases from the oil and gas sector. And there are two principal types of molecules that get emitted, carbon dioxide and methane. I focus on methane and have been doing so for the last 10 to 15 years. And we are going to focus on methane right here. And I am going to give you three statements, okay? And there's two truths and a lie in these statements, okay? So are you ready for these statements? I'm ready. Brilliant. Okay. Statement one, methane has a relatively short atmospheric lifetime compared to carbon dioxide, but it is much more efficient at trapping heat. Statement number two, there are no feasible technological solutions to detect and reduce methane emissions from industry. Statement three, small drones similar to the ones used for video footage of landscapes can be equipped with sensors that help detect methane emissions in hazardous and hard to reach areas. So out of those statements, there are two truths and one lie. David, could you reveal to us, first of all, the two truths? The first and third statements were true, that uh, methane is a short-lived greenhouse gas and is very potent, and that we could use drones to try and go look for methane emissions. Ah, we are going to delve into these more. But first, that means that the second one must be a lie in terms of there being no feasible technological solutions to detect and reduce methane emissions from industry. So that's the lie. That's a lie for the energy sector. It's very Ah. uh, difficult to... um, reduce emissions from other types of sources, for example, agriculture sources that are growing rice, very difficult to minimize methane emissions. But in the energy sector, there are lots of things we can do. So yeah, it's, it's from from the energy sector, from industry, it's that that's the key, the key message in that statement. So let's dive in to statement number one, which was a truth. Methane has a relatively short atmospheric lifetime compared to carbon dioxide, but is much more efficient at trapping heat. Now, to me, I'm quite the optimist. So yes, it is more efficient at trapping heat, but because it has this shorter life cycle within the atmosphere, surely it could be a positive thing because it means that because it's short lived, if we make changes to the emissions and reduce them, then it means we can actually have a large impact on reducing emissions quickly and see that effect quickly. Correct? Well, partly. So methane is really potent. It's about a mass basis. So kilogram of methane produces about as much warming in the atmosphere today as 120 kilograms of carbon dioxide. And so if we can get rid of the methane, and get the methane out of the atmosphere. That has a really big effect. What makes a greenhouse gas a greenhouse gas is this heat trapping ability, but also how long it's going to last in the atmosphere. When we talk about methane not persisting very long, what that means is if we release methane today, after about 10 years, half of it will be gone. After another 10 years, another half will be gone, and so on. So short-lived is short-lived compared to a century or more. And so if we uh, reduce methane today, we're going to have a big effect, but we're going to see most of the benefits from that over the next several decades. 
understood, understood. I was kind of like, oh, we can just reduce the emissions and then monitor the effect. And But yes, it's not a case of just doing it one day and then monitoring it the next. This is a, a decades long study. Short lived is still a half life of 10 years. Um, gosh, yes. So it is something that we need to be looking at and changing, especially when and I'm, I'm going to use these words loosely, one kilogram of methane emissions is just as uh, climate critical, let's call it, as 120 kilograms of CO2. That is that is huge. So let's move on to the second statement, which was the lie, which was there are no feasible technological solutions to detect and reduce methane emissions from industry. So there are technological solutions. Could you just tell us some of these that currently exist and how we're using them? Well, let's break that into two parts. Let's break that into the technologies for detecting and then the technologies for reducing. So for detecting, if you had asked that question 15 years ago, we wouldn't have had many technologies that you could put out and look for methane emissions in the millions of oil and gas sites around the world. But over the last decade, there's been a revolution in sensing technologies and getting those deployed out in very challenging environments. And now we have sensors that you can put on sites. We have sensors that can be on vehicles that you drive by sites. We have drones, we have sensors on airplanes, we have sensors on satellites. There are all these different technological solutions that are being deployed and being deployed in very efficient ways. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the sensing, isn't it? And so in terms of the reduction, what do those practically look like? Well, there are two ways to think about reduction. One is the reductions associated with those methane emissions that we get because we're intentionally releasing methane. And so there are methane emissions, just like there are emissions of carbon dioxide, that are designed into facilities. They're in there by design. And well, we change the design and we can get rid of those emissions. There are other methane emissions that occur because equipment gets broken or malfunctions in some way. And in that case, we need to have all these detection technologies to go out and look for those methane emissions from the sources that are due to malfunctions. We need to look for those broken devices that are causing emissions of methane. And... What really excites me about what you're saying is, one, the optimism when it comes to solutions around climate change, but also the amount of work that has progressed over the last decade. And they're going to continue to progress, which leads us on to statement three, which sounds like slightly sci-fi, but it's not. You're saying it's a truth and it's something that's happening right now is that we're using drones and we're equipping them with sensors that can help detect this methane in hazardous and hard to reach areas. So what what does this information look like? How precise is it? How are we gathering it? How do we see it and make sense of it all? Well, there are lots of different types of measurements that we can make, ranging from a person walking around a site with a camera that's designed to detect methane, to drones, to satellites. Maybe let me focus on satellites to indicate why I'm optimistic about these technologies. A feature of satellites is that they get deployed globally. You don't need anybody's permission to go and examine their site with a satellite. And you can look around the world. And in fact, if you go on the web today, you can look at satellite detections of large methane releases detected from the International Space Station and an observatory aboard the International Space Station and see methane plumes around the world. That is new. And the detection limits, the amount of methane it takes for the satellite to be able to see it is getting lower and lower and lower all the time. And when you say see it, what does it 
come through as you know there's there's cameras that can in inverted commas see methane is it a bit like how we uh with thermal imaging camera how is that information displayed to us so it makes sense well the way you would see it on the web so that it's designed so that it's easily interpretable is a color-coded plume coming off of a site and that's what you would see if you go look on the web and look at the data products produced by various sensing systems, whether they be drones or airplanes or satellites. And you can convert that using a variety of analysis systems into what the emission rate is by looking at that plume. What the satellite is actually seeing, though, is typically the effectively the warming that the methane is causing. It's seeing less of the light being emitted by the earth reaching the satellite and it says oh there must be methane there because i'm not seeing this infrared light escape from the planet and so what the satellite is actually seeing is not a color image of a plume it's doing that through the data interpretation. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, David, as we look towards the next decades, what are you most excited about within this sector? The message that we often get about climate change is grim, and it often leaves people feeling, well, there's nothing that can be done. I teach a course to university freshmen every year, and we talk about climate a lot, and we talk about what can be done. Reducing methane emissions from the energy sector is one of the biggest short-term things that we can do. And it gives me optimism that we can attack this problem and make a real difference. We'll still have climate change, but we can mitigate it somewhat. How big a mitigation is this compared to things we could do around CO2? Well, the emissions of methane from the global energy sector, if we could get that to zero to keep all that methane in the pipe in the energy sector, the warming effect of that would be the equivalent of taking the carbon dioxide emissions from all the cars in the world down to zero. Many people think we can get energy sector methane emissions down to zero by 2030. Can you think of anything else that we could do that would be at the scale of take all the cars in the world off the road by 2030? Uh, I can't think of anything else. That's why I work on this problem and I spend all my time on this problem is because I think it's the biggest thing we can do in the short term. Amazing. And what a what a pitch for methane, uh, a gas that often isn't in the climate change conversation. And the fact that if it is, it just gives us something else in our arsenal to be able to outsmart the effects of climate change and come up with those such badly needed mitigations. Yeah, it doesn't mean we can ignore carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is still really important. And just solving the methane problem won't solve all the effects of climate change. But it's something we can do really fast. And as we're starting to already suffer the effects of climate change, doing stuff really fast is important. Absolutely. David, it has been wonderful to pick your brains about this. Thank you so much for imparting your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And that is it for our first ever bonus episode. Thank you, of course, to our guest, Dave Allen, professor at the University of Texas. I'm Fran Scott, and the Process Automation Podcast is a fresh air production for ABB. Follow now from wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. See you next time.